Good morning, everybody. Guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren. Und ein sehr herzliches Willkommen an Sie alle. Willkommen zu den vielen Ministern und ihren Delegationen aus den mehr als 50 Ländern, die Mitglieder des Forums sind. Ein warmes Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim aus Türkei. Ein herzliches Willkommen an unseren Präsidenten, Herr Yildirim
Again, a very warm welcome to you all, and we wish you a fruitful and stimulating conference. I'm now pleased to hand over to Melinda Crane, who will moderate the rest of the morning session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jack. It's a great pleasure to be back in Leipzig this year. Just as last year, there's been a whole lot of food for thought and food for pleasure as well. It was a wonderful reception we all went to yesterday evening, and the man who treated us to that is the chair of this year's forum, Binaldi Yildirim. His country wields increasing regional and international influence spanning Europe and Asia. Geopolitically, it's destined to bridge differences, which is a good match, since that's what this forum aims to do as well. So would you please give a very warm welcome now to our next speaker, the Turkish Minister of Transport, Binali Di Yildirim. Distinguished Ministers, Secretary General, their participants, ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to welcome you all here today at the second International Transport Forum on behalf of my country, Republic of Turkey. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Your Excellencies, Secretary General Mr. Jack Short and his team for uh, tireless effort preparation of this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, at this conference is a time-wise very important because we facing a global financial crisis when we choose the title of the conference, at that time there was no crisis at all. No transport for global economy, challenges and opportunities. No, the time comes, we face very deep financial crisis. This topic, this title even become more and more important for the whole transport sector. Globalization of production and trade are perhaps the foremost characteristic of our era. The large scale of economic activities, astonishing speed of technologic development, allow lower production cost, higher productivity, and greater wealth today. Transport, no doubt, is an indispensable part of this process as being a vital production, distribution, and mobility tool. This sector drives trade by interconnecting every business to the markets all over the world and is absolutely crucial for economic growth and competitiveness. Naturally, Transport is one of the sectors that has been heavily affected by the global financial crisis. It is now obvious that a contracting global economy, a corresponding downfall in transport demands, the freeze of credit and increased operational costs have led to an unforeseen wave of economic difficulties and job losses in the sector. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, shrinking demand originating from global crisis has led a considerable decrease in import and export, global trade, and serious recession in the sector consequently. Liquid crunch, liquidity crunch experience, especially in the developed countries, led to economic constriction in general terms, and thus decreasing in demand 
led to recession. As the demand for transport services is decreasing rapidly, deadly competition among the actors is emerging. Transport companies are significantly decreasing the size of their flats. And the economic difficulties force to cut jobs. As it is directly linked to economic activity and trade, freight transport suffers from the negative effects of economic crisis more severely. The main impact of the crisis on the freight transport is falling demand for transport services owing to the decrease in circulation of capital, capitals and goods. Their participants, another vital issue challenging our sector is the credit crunch, which is a direct consequence of the financial crisis. With the degrees of willingness and the capabilities of the bank to lend credit, trade finance, global trade, and consequently transport area got a severe blow. Limited access to the credits and insufficient liquidity are especially a major concern for capital investive operators such as logistic companies investing and employing costly equipment. Transport companies are struggling to survive with their limited financial sources and credit opportunities in an environment where the global production and trade are shrinking. Their participants, the answers to the above mentioned challenges in the transport sector, we began to look for a way to deal with those affected by minimum damage. Recovery plans to cope with impact of economic downturn on transport sector may rise public debt, which may later on transform into extra taxes or reduce public financing for transport infrastructure. In this context, it is important that the public and private sector work together to establish a modern, efficient, and sustainable transportation system to take the advantage of upturn in the economy when it comes. Some say less than a year, some more than a year. It is still unclear how long the recession will last, but until it is over, it is essential to put in place a coordinated response to help the transport sector in facing these challenges. Hence, the, even during the crisis environment, domestic demand should be kept alive. Projects realized nationally shall meet the loss of internationally. The remedy of the crisis is to invest in order to support domestic markets. Otherwise, there is always a potential that the crisis will deepen and deepen. Shortage of the financial resources for transport infrastructure project has become a more delicate issue during this period. Therefore, international planning and prioritization should focus on the global transport accessibility, interconnections, and missing links. We should be aware of the fact that investment in transport infrastructure has a vital role in the current economic downturn. Our priority must be to continue to invest in transport infrastructure that can stimulate an economy-wide upturn and create jobs. You know, is and during the crisis, many countries, including developed countries, they uh, set up 
a certain stimulating package investing infrastructure project. Because the, during crisis time, the only sector which don't need the demand is infrastructure. If you invest and support any other sector, manufacturing, goods and services, they need trade and marketing. But if we invest in infrastructure, there is no need, urgent need for demand. It is only necessary for, to be ready for the future. And improve your infrastructure will, of course, reduce cost of transportation. This will provide advantage of global trade and domestic trade freely. Ladies and gentlemen, in this regard, both public sector and banks and private sector should co collaborate in current hard days and share additional short-term cost of constructing transport infrastructure to enjoy benefits together with long-term. Private funding for infrastructure development, either directly or via private partnership is crucially important instrument for economic recovery because, you know, uh, all the time, the general budget of the, of the government not sufficient for uh, improving infrastructure project. So that we need, even it is too important during crisis period, to use alternative financing possibilities, PPP or BOT, whatever available. In this regard, government should take necessary measures to encourage private sector to invest in transport infrastructure. During this period, national protect protectionist policies isolationist measures and any drawbacks will absolutely worsen the situation. On the contrary, the global crisis could pave way for more eagle cooperation among the actors for the eliminating of many non-physical barriers thanks to the urgency that the crisis created the broken resistance of some parties as a result of the crisis as well. Simplification and harmonization of procedures of transport activities, eliminating problems at the border crossing and the solutions to other kind of restrictions against the international transport should be at the top of our agenda. We must act together to prevent deepening effect of the crisis. As we see here today, the climate for international cooperation is more favorable than ever before. I believe that we all have the consciousness of the shared responsibility to combat with the economic downturn and the to restore the stability, confidence, and growth. In this regard, timing of this forum, the second international transport forum, under the topic transport for global economy, challenges, opportunities in economic downturn is crucial. It is being held at a time when the transport sector is undertaking the burden of the financial crisis. It provides us with a good opportunity to access together the challenges and opportunities that this crisis brings. I truly believe that all of us are ready with our all effort to restore confidence in global economy and make our transport sector less vulnerable. 
distinguished gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, we should look beyond if we wish to overcome the effect of this crisis. Our short-term measures should not include our long-term objectives. Having the presidency of the second annual meeting, Turkey is confident that the forum year 2009 will provide strong outcome for maintaining international transport activities fast, efficient, secure enough to keep up with the dynamism of the global economy. I would like to conclude my words saying that during these two days, we will have a very fruitful discussion and meeting, panels, session, in order to, to reduce the effect of global financial crisis on the transport sector. Once again, I would like to thank those who contributed to this international event, especially host country, my colleague, Mr. Tiffenzi and his team, Jack Short and his team, and the city uh, mayor of Leipzig contribute a lot. And I warmly welcome you all for the participating in this important event. I thank you all with my respect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Well, you spoke about fiscal stimulus, and Leipzig is certainly a city that's been the beneficiary of a great deal of fiscal stimulus over the past 20 years. And it's also a very stimulating place, and was before it got all that stimulus as well. And it's thanks to our next speaker that we have the pleasure of convening here in Leipzig. Wolfgang Tiefensee was mayor of Leipzig before he joined Chancellor Angela Merkel's cabinet in 2005. And I think because this is the 20th anniversary this year of the fall of the Berlin Wall, it's also perhaps worth noting that Wolfgang Tiefensee began his political career 20 years ago with the Democracy Now! movement that grew up out of the fall of the wall. So please do give a very warm welcome to the host of the International Transport Forum, the Federal Minister for Transport, Building and Urban Development, Wolfgang Tiefensee. Dear Jack Short, dear colleague Ben Ali Yildirim, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, participants of the Second International Transport Forum, on behalf of the Federal Government of Germany and the Federal Republic of Germany, let me welcome you here. At the Leipzig Fair, we are happy to see that in this room now, every chair is occupied by a participant. Ladies and gentlemen, we are facing a common challenge. We also have common interests. We have common visions. We have a major common responsibility. And together, we must take up the commitment in order to meet those challenges. The International Trade Forum, now taking place for the second time in Leipzig, is a, an ideal platform for dialogue between politicians and business people, companies and the scientific community and politicians, representatives of the public domain, of the media, and for all of them to look for solutions in difficult times. So let me welcome you most heartily to participate in these debates and discussions. Our topic, namely connecting the globalized world and transport, is the very apropos topic. When we thought about what the topic should be for the conference, nobody at that time knew that we would be in the midst of a crisis this crisis 
will not paper over the central problems without also being able to look at the backdrop of the economic and financial crisis. Here, we need to create also jobs and save those jobs, especially as far as they're concerned, the different sectors of industry, transport. Then, of course, we have the problems of demographic change. We have a different makeup of our societies now, but also, of course, quality of life and accepting transport, traffic, what that means, and also security and safety of our transportation technology. Now, if you think that this is the opening event, then I have to remind you that yesterday another event was inaugurated. 200 children inaugurated a children's university. Moritz Leuenberger, a colleague of mine and I, together with the mayor of Leipzig, Burkhard Jung, we stood and answered the questions that children had about the future. And it was so amazing to see children, eight years old, already knew about CO2, were able to pronounce the words biodiesel. And they said, why aren't we building a car where you have mineral water and you could shake that mineral water and use that energy that's created in order to drive our vehicles. Incredible ideas were developed in order to come up with those questions and then to try to find answers. So in other words, we have to deal actually with the hard facts of reality. Now, what is it that we must not do and what is it that we should do. Now, what we must not do is to protect our markets. Protectionism, building a fortress, building walls around our countries and markets is bad. It hurts the economy, it hurts the field of research, it hurts our consumers, and it hurts everyone. So, therefore, let's keep our markets open. Let's keep our countries and borders open. Let's look for solutions together. Now, what is it that we must and should do? We must bet on innovation. And if it is going to be possible to come from that valley that we're in at the moment and move up again, and then we have to bet on new standards, new technology, innovation. For example, within the stability pacts that are being created, 500 million euros are going to be used in order to drive electrification of our drive systems. We want to research battery systems, accumulator systems. We want to do field research in the different regions because electrical mobility will be one way of getting out of the predicament we're in. So let's take this form that we now have here in order to find solutions and how to move even more strengthened out of the difficulties that we're in at the moment. So dear colleagues, dear ministers of transport, we're not the ministers only responsible for infrastructure. That is also part of our portfolio. And bringing that forward is the right road to go down. But it is much more. We are the ones who are responsible for efficiently using our modes and means of transport for making sure that climate change is thwarted by means of new technologies, by organizing transport in an intelligent manner. That is our purview. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely pleased and I'm looking forward to getting down to work again with everyone from Leipzig, and uh, I'm glad to see that you 
have supported us in making Leipzig once again a center for this development. And I hope that our common vision, our common challenges will be met in very concrete common projects. It's up to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. I now have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker. As you know, this year's ITF is subtitled Challenges and Opportunities in the Downturn. And Jacques Attali is a man who knows a great deal about turning a challenge into an opportunity. He is the president and founder of Planet Finance, an NGO with the aim of fighting poverty through microfinance. He also heads A&A, &A, which is an international consulting firm that specializes in new technologies. He was the special advisor to French President François Mitterrand, and he served as the first president of the European Bank for Reconstruction Development from 1991 to 1993. He's the author of 51 books translated into more than 30 languages, at least that was the last count when I looked. His most recent work is La Crise et Après. And we're looking for some answers to that question and are very happy to welcome Jacques Attali. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to be here to speak with you. As I see a lot of my French friends, uh, I will use my own language if you don't mind. Je suis très heureux d'être ici avec vous. Et très heureux. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. And you asked me what I think about the crisis and how the transport sector will be impacted by the crisis. I was asked to speak on this topic uh, for 20 minutes. So basically, it's going to be a very broad brush picture in a nutshell. If you doubt that there is any link between transport and crisis, well, well you probably have read the newspaper. I mean, gen gen GM, General Motors uh, this morning, etc., and the newspaper headlines, so there are very specific impacts here. You all know that transportation is one of the uh, aspects where economic progress uh, has made itself m most palpable and the same applies to the maritime sector. But uh, there are also other issues which we need to look at. Uh, transport is a growth um, factor, but it also has a curbing impact and it will have a strong impact on the environment. The transport sector is going to become the bogeyman for all kinds of economic changes. Now, you asked me to make a statement and give you my views on this. Of course, everybody will have their own views on the crisis, the duration of the, the prospective duration of the crisis. Well, I'm one of the more pessimist uh, um, augurs, and I think that the crisis is just at its very out, uh, beginning. The crisis has various mechanisms. These mechanisms take place at three different levels, and these mechanisms are also manifest at various points. Let's take the United States. In the United States, we have a middle class which was more or less stable, stagnant uh, in the 1980s. And instead of compensating this by, for instance, either raising payroll or, and so, sorry, um, 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 increasing the revenue level or the um, remuneration levels, um, Instead, the government decided to steer the banking sector and uh, provide subsidies to the banking sector. And within this uh, banking sector, the automotive industry was very important in the United States because people took out loans to buy cars and to buy homes. And, of course, um, there was an ex excessive growth in lending and this uh, there was a spillover effect of these bad loans which impacted the entire world this was the first mechanism but i said there were three mechanisms and now let's talk about the second mechanism
banks, um, joined forces and uh, they created loan pools. However, the risk was understated. Revenue and profit was extreme. Everybody was in the game. Everybody was uh, benefiting from this. I mean, even those people who were the lobbies, uh, lobbyists for the poorest uh, of the poor um, benefited from this. And of course, this is a contradiction on the market and there was a regulation which was absent here at the local level. We in Europe know this. We created a common market within 30 years, but we also know that there is no such thing as a single market without a, a single regulation. We also have the uh, Economic Monetary Union, and the same has to take place across the entire globe. We need to have a single market across the globe and a single regulation. We do not only need the legal texts, but we also need to enforce them and need to make sure that there's compliance. And this is basically the, at the root cause of this crisis. Let's take a look at history, more or less. This crisis is nothing but the expression of the fatigue of the Occident, of the Western world, and an American historist uh, once dubbed uh, uh, or saw a dichotomy between the old and the new Europe. But I think there's an old West, old Occident, and the United States forms part of this old West. There are three factors, the population, capital, and technological progress here in this old Occident. The, for the past two dec uh, centuries, this progress is backed by the nations which form part of the quote-unquote old Occident, but the population which came from the new Occident, uh, the migration, created this growth, and there are no longer savings deposits in the United States. Of course, this does exist in other countries, it does still exist in other countries, but um, in view of the major financial innovations which came and in view of the major remittances, the funding which came brought a lot of attraction to the universities and then to the research sectors. And if you look at this on a historical timescale, you may quickly come to the conclusion that the Occident was a magnet for these forces. It was a magnet for capital, for equity, and it drew in everything, all the resources where there was a scarcity in uh, the old Occident. It was an artificial growth um, which was maintained artificially. Five billion or eight billion, of course, have a, have a huge impact. The Chinese did precisely the same. They followed the same development trajectory. Chinese scientists went to Europe, went to the United States, and now they go back home. So China makes sure that the brain drain is compensated, is uh, reversed again, that people go back to the roots, go to the, uh, go to the country of origin. And I think it is the fatigue of the Occident which is the driving force behind um, this crisis. As a result of the high debt uh, ratio, as the result of the high leverage, uh, this cre crisis is maintained artificially. Um, now, of course, I would hope that this was the end of the crisis, but I mean, if everybody uh, think, well, all of those who think that this is the end of the crisis, um, hope that this is true or think that is, is, it is true, and I, of course, hope that this is true. But what is the scenario which I'm about to paint here? Question to you. Is the crisis, uh, has the crisis reached its end? Question. We've seen a major downturn, minus 60 to 70 percent in economic growth in some sectors. Uh, the financial sector, however, has undergone restructuring. The stock exchange prices are rising again. Some countries, like China, see growth rates again. The what we call the uh, green shoot or green root, uh, uh, green leaves um, appear again on the trees. There's a silver lining on the horizon. Billions and billions have been uh, spent. Banks 
can return to offering uh, to offer liquidity. People can um, take out loans again, and there is a s certain dynamism, an economic dynamism, which is um, taking place again and which is uh, showing itself again. I would really hope that this recovery was here to cha to stay and the American system is truly the mainstay of this entire organization and I do hope that this uh, recovery is here to stay, of course. But what about the cash flow of banks? Is that sustainable? What about banking solvency? What about the budgets of the major countries or the major nation states and the liquidity and cash flow if there's no solvency of banks then this will this recovery will not be sustainable the lending the low lending rates will not be sustainable and uh, solvency of the banks is not back in the green 93 trillion dollars are in circulation and this money is tied up or wrapped up in toxic waste of course there's a relaunch i mean um, these bad products are being weeded out but on the other hand um, it's not the end of the day yet so people still have more homework to do before confidence in the banks and their solvency is restored. Growth is very sluggish. Sometimes there's also zero growth. And there will still be a couple of encumbrances for solvencies. The people who are affected by this are not only the middle class, but uh, also the real estate agents, the agencies, the credit rating agencies. Everybody talks about economic lending and the domino effect which we have seen with regard to the banking sector in the US. Of course we all live in integrated economic systems and this means that this will not only impact the local market. I do hope that the system holds true and that there will not be any successive spillover effects where bad banks will uh, proliferate because I think this is very dangerous. Or nationalization and what we are about to do nowadays for General Motors could in the future also be proposed for other systems. My second question, which I would like to posit here, is what about the credibility of uh, money and uh, budgets? The global deficit is currently exploding. There's uh, excessive debt everywhere. Everybody knows that the crisis can only be overcome if we cut back our debts. What have we been doing for the past one and a half years? Well, debt is on the increase, and I think this will deteriorate the crisis in the long term. Let's briefly talk about the American economy. During the global economic uh, crisis, uh, our uh, um, debt ratio was 205 times the B, uh, GDP, and now we are at the ratio of 305 times the GDP. That is the US. And all players uh, um, have uh, five, uh, on aggregate, have 500 times the GDP. Uh, debt ratio and uh, the global GDP is also um, affected by this, obviously. 11 to 13 trillion dollars debt. That's what we're talking about. And the global financial system has actually already um, maybe given in. And it won't be able to compensate and extricate from itself from this crisis. Of course, we may assume that China will adopt a different uh, approach here. In the past, people talk, kept talking about 
uh, billions of dollars, and now we, the order of magnitude has shifted to trillions. The currency uh, reserves in China are $2 trillion, and that's about the deficit which is accrued in the U.S. over one year. The new administration in the U.S. declares that they want plan to overcome the deficit. So at the moment, there are a lot of uh, question marks which abound. And it is not entirely clear whether we will be able to extricate ourselves from this crisis or whether due to the sheer magnitude of the crisis, we won't be able to overcome the crisis at all anymore. Well, basically, we can see three scenarios here. First of all, we could we may assume that there's a deepening of the crisis, that the, that we will be plunged even deeper into a recession, that uh, the global economy will remain in the doldrums, a zero percent growth in the U.S. and uh, and maybe next year we'll also have uh, zero growth in Europe, um, or even negative growth. And we may take it that these problems will see a further exacerbation unless we will be able to extricate ourselves from this predicament. Or maybe we generate another bubble, a collective bubble. That's the only thing which we can do, the only remedy which we can adopt here. Another high uh, debt uh, of the various nation states or the US, the Europe, Asia, in, um, Japan. Of course, you can uh, borrow, you can live on borrowing. You can also make, um, lead an excellent life. Japan has been living a life with uh, debts for a long time. Um, and the U.S. is the biggest um, power in the world, and everybody pretends as if uh, this huge, despite this huge deficit, the dollar was still the um, haven of stability. Or, and that's the third scenario, we may see another um, growth period with a high savings rate high degree of deposits, savings deposits, always assuming that we have uh, high uh, growth rates again, but there we will see a lot of uh, volatility and uh, blips. We've known this, these blips for many decades. We are the decision makers. We've seen these blips in the past. Uh, I mean, we're decision makers, we're policy makers, and we may say, well, we'll just wait for the bubble to unfold, etc. But sooner or later, the bubble is going to backfire. And of course, you can say, well, okay, that's life. I mean, after the recession, you'll see an inflation. But now I'm going to use a word. Well, one of the major historical scholars was here uh, in this city, and in one of the most uh, one of the darkest chapters of German history, we had one of the most courageous uh, advocates here in Leipzig, who was living here in Leipzig, and he said back then, nowadays we are threatened by an ev evolution towards a Weimar, a planetary Weimar e um, evolution and inflation. And you, I mean, everybody who's uh, German here in the audience will know what I mean when I use the buzzword Weimar. Weimar was a genuine tragedy and it was followed by the darkest chapters of German history. I mean, that's, a, um, that's the truth. I mean, we may turn a blind eye to this and we could pretend as though we had the funds uh, and the means to um, do more borrowing and as though this we may kick ourselves and think this is sustainable, but this is not true. I mean, we Europeans have our own history and we learned our lesson from history. We understand that uh, we need to wake up to the truth and we need to economize. And we must not just bank on the deposits in other people's bank accounts. Uh, we must compensate our budgets or we must uh, um, 
and we must set rules and regulations so as to overcome our budget deficit and reduce the budget deficit. We all know that tax Taxes have almost become a dirty word in many countries, but we've got no choice. We need to use taxes to offset this disbalance. For last but not least, the resolution is regulation, better international prudential supervision. I'm not saying more regulation, I'm saying better regulation. We've got regulation in place, but the thing is it was never applied. We do have rules and regulations. We have the Basel, Basel uh, Capital Accord, and Basel was not applied accordingly. Banks, for instance. Basel II, so that solvency was regulated under Basel. Basel said that the debt ratio uh, that the um, must not exceed uh, the factor of 12 of uh, the deposits in your bank, and these rules were not complied with. And that means that the rules are not a pro problem, but compliance is a problem. How can we improve compliance? Very often in the past, we just paid lip service. We never really walked the talk. We just uh, um, adopted regulations, but there was a lack of monitoring. So accountability was an issue. We promulgated various rules and regulations, but monitoring and follow-up was really an issue. Compliance. This growth will see a completely new dimension. And once we have weathered the storm, once we have come out of this bubble, and once we see the emergence of another bubble, and uh, that's a bubble where we don't know what's in the future. I mean, for instance, what about climate change? All of this is going to be very uncertain. But if the new bubble is going to materialize in an unregulated market, then we will just uh, uh, rail, com be completely derailed. Uh, climate, for instance, is something that we can't really control. And we do know that we needed to do a home, that we've been doing or there was a need to do homework quite some time ago. But basically, we can really learn the lesson from the financial crisis. We need to get a grip on this monster, and we need to take uh, action now. We need rules and regulations. Otherwise, we won't have learned any lesson from the financial crisis and in the uh, field of the economic problems. The whole story is just going to repeat itself again. History is going to repeat itself again unless we learn the lessons. Now, in the economic stimulus packages, we've always said, well, we've uh, already learned our lesson. We've got more motorways to construct and we can provide subsidies to the automotive industry, etc. And in the past, we did this, that or the other, and that's what worked uh, in order to provide a stimulus to the economy. But actually, this is um, the worst we could do trying to repeat the old recipes, trying to repeat the old mistakes and hoping that things will improve. I mean, you've got an excellent building site in front of you, but of course transportation is important, but transport, uh, the means of modes of transport need to be completely revised. They need to be compatible, compatible with our new environmental rules and regulations. You have an excellent task ahead of you, and uh, I trust you to weather this storm. And I will, uh, I trust that this crisis will very soon only be a bad memory. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Very interesting uh, to hear your thoughts. In your last book, The Brief History of the Future, you talked about, and of course it was written before the crisis, about the development of globalization into something which you referred to as nomadization, a sort of uh, hyper-globalization. How would you revise that prognosis in light of the crisis? Do you think we'll see something that people are now calling reverse globalization? This affects many people in the room who are worried about reconfiguration of supply lines, protectionism, a rollback, essentially, of globalization. Well, uh, you're kind enough to remember that this book, which has now just been published in, in English, and in this book, I forecast the crisis. I thought the crisis will happen later. That means that very often we, we are wrong, not in predicting, but in predicting the timing of events. Uh, either we will accept to uh, jump into a global governance, if not a global government, but at least a global governance, and the G20 is just the beginning of that, 
or we'll suddenly go back to uh, protectionism. Nationalization is a first step towards protectionism. And nomadism is another name of market economy, because market economy means that merchants can move, companies can move, products will move. Either we'll accept to organize global nomadism, or we'll go to a, 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 a catastrophe. It's why it's so important to solve the question of budget deficit and, 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 and trust in two currencies. It's why it's so important to jump to what the Chinese government has proposed, to, to think about something like a global currency. We in Europe, we know that we, do not, we could not have a, a, a global market and have a circulation of goods without a, a common currency, without a single currency, because exchange rates is one of the devices that can lead to protectionism. And then either we will be able in the next 20 years to have a dream of a global currency or global governance, or protectionism will be, will be back. Thank you very, very much. Well, Monsieur Attali mentioned the pouce vert, the green shoots, and certainly that speech was full of green shoots that could be fruitful for our next discussion. We do come now to our first panel discussion, which is entitled The Downturn's Economic Impacts for Transport. And if you've looked at the program, you know that we have a very heavy hitting group of guests who will be joining us. But just a few hints, first of all, on the rest of the morning's proceedings. We do have two panels this morning, um, some very meaty subjects to get through, but you do get a break in between. In about an hour after the first discussion, we will have a break, but we would be very, very grateful if you would return promptly after half an hour for the second panel. And when we finish our entire morning, when we're done with our second panel, we are going to ask some of you who have received invitations to the minister's lunch to stay behind uh, for a few moments, and we're going to ask you to go out that way, but I will remind you at the end of the morning about the logistics of that. This audience hardly needs reminding, and we have certainly heard a great deal more this morning about the havoc which the crisis has wreaked upon the transport sector container ships at anchor, freight cars on the sidings, airlines and automakers struggling to break even or even in some cases simply to survive. Now in this first panel, we want to take a look at how plummeting demand, fluctuating fuel prices and liquidity crunch are changing the way that the transport industry does business. How is it changing the business plans of the industries that you're involved in? We want to look at what national governments and what international organizations can do to help and what they should not do to hinder trade and transport. And I am now going to call out this amazing group of experts that the ITF has put together to address these questions. I'm going to ask them to come up to the stage one by one as I call out their names. And uh, before I do that, I'd like to also note that we do have with us Professor Anthony Venables of Oxford University, who has been so kind as to offer to serve as our rapporteur for these two discussions this morning. So he is going to join us later on in the second panel on the stage, and he will give us the benefits of his wisdom at the end of our discussions this morning. So I will now call out our guests, and please do join us then on the stage uh, moving from left to right. Anthony Albanese is the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government for Australia. Welcome. <laughs> Camille Erlings is the Minister of Transport, Public Works and Water Management for the Netherlands. <laughs> Rudiger Grube is the new CEO of the Deutsche Bahn. Joachim Hunold is the CEO of Air Berlin. <laughs> Kandan Kalitekin is his colleague, the CEO of Turkish Airlines. <laughs> Ms. 
Leif Östling is the CEO of Scania. John Rice is Vice Chairman of GE. Wolfgang Tiefensee is familiar to all of you from his very interesting speech a moment ago, Germany's Minister of Transport. And Ron Widows is the CEO of Neptune Orient Lines, NOL. And now, I'm just going to ask Leif Ersling, if you would be so kind as to go and sit next to, well, yes, okay, okay, we can do it like that. Mr. Rice, would you move down one? Thank you. And if you would move there, then I'm just going to take that chair. That way I'm more or less in the middle. <laughs> Thank you very much. Herr Gruber, revenues, Deutsche Bahn revenues way down in the first quarter. DB Schenker taking quite a hit. This was hardly the economic climate in which you then wanted to spend your first uh, weeks on the job cleaning out the Augean stables uh, at home, but you've taken care of that now. You've done, uh, done the work in-house. What are going to be your main priorities now moving forward for Deutsche Bahn? How do you want to make it fit to survive this crisis and flourish? This is great. First, I would like to say it's a great pleasure for me to be a new member in this great family. Uh, secondly, there's no doubt about that, that it's a must that I have to focus on the challenges insofar as the economic worldwide crisis is concerned. But frankly speaking, I'm a little bit surprised that people are wondering that the worldwide crisis has started in the second half year of 2008. Uh, I was uh, in 2007 a uh, couple of months in, for example, Mr. Atali, you mentioned this, in New York, and uh, there was five big banks. They asked me, Mr. Grube, you have heard about the subprime crisis. I said, no, no, I'm a pure engineer. What does it mean? So what is my message? The world is wondering that this worldwide crisis has started in 2008. That is totally wrong. The crisis has already started much time before. First one. Second one is, uh, you were asking what is now my task. My task is to avoid because uh, a development which is against globalization. Because if you would like to fight for globalization, then you must be in favor for transport and logistics. Otherwise, globalization will not take place. But in order to make it happen, I think it's very important to make sure that we have fair trade assumptions and conditions. And this is a little bit my concern that we are going back uh, with Mr. Atalali, you mentioned this, with uh, protectionism measures. This would be totally, totally wrong. Uh, and I'm a totally also a believer that the crisis will be longer than our wishes, uh, but we should not make uh, mistakes uh, in order to avoid for longer term uh, trading in the whole world. And therefore, I would like to come and I think we should use the crisis and not uh, use stimulation programs for all technologies. I think we should spend more money in research and technology. Only use one example. In Germany, the automotive industry spends 85 billion, 18.5 billion, only for research and technology. If you go to the railway business, they are spending only the industry spend million. And everybody knows that the railways business is the cleanest one insofar as environmental performance is concerned. So what I would like to say is we have to fight for equal and fair conditions. So I can continue, but I would like to make it even a little bit shorter well, here. For DB itself, what would be your main aims in terms of modernizing the company? Yeah. We certainly know one way it changed your business plan. You had to put off your IPO. When do you see Deutsche Bahn finally taking a real step toward privatization? There's no doubt about uh, that it must be our <laughs> target to create an IPO. But on the other hand, I must tell you, uh, the reason to go public is to get, create money. 
And I tell you, is the conditions for an IPO are not there. So where should I spend time now uh, to focus on an IPO? I will do this when the uh, conditions are right. So therefore, my main message internally and externally is that we should focus only on a company which is profitable. Not only profitable in revenue, sustainable profitable. This is the first target. Second, I'm always uh, wondering that people asking, you would like to go back, so uh, have uh, going back so for, 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 for a, a, a railway system which is available for everybody without paying uh, ticket prices and so on. I tell you, this is a clear condition by the politician that I have to manage this kind of business in a very profitable way. You can read this in our Grundgesetz. Yeah? There's an article 87 and it's crystal clear that the Deutsche Bahn must be managed in a profitable way and like an Aktiengesellschaft. So this is crystal clear. There's no space in order to discuss this. And another point is, we are investing every year 7 billion euro and 2.5 billion are our own uh, money. So if we would like to continue with this amount of investments, so we have to create our own money and to be profitable. Second one is, you know, that uh, today our rating is excellent. Standard & Poor, Moody's & Fitch, we have an AA rating. If we would like to go down to triple B, I tell you, I have to pay 300 basis points more. I tell you, I would like to spend this even in education or in services and not to the capital market. Third one is uh, the debt. Yeah, the indebtedness of uh, Deutsche Bahn is still 16 billion. Our target is, at least for the first step, to come to equity to debt to one to one. So I have to pay back uh, the money. So you can see there is really a must to be profitable, sustainable, profitable. There's no alternative to this. And maybe can I add one thing? Briefly. Uh, you please take care of what's happened in the automotive industry. The automotive industry, ladies and gentlemen, today has a capacity of 90, billion, 90 million cars a year. That's the installed capacity. The market today is only 45 to 50 million. So that is not only a financial and worldwide crisis, it's also a structural crisis. And nobody will accept this. My friend, my old friend, Mr. Oesling, he knows this also from the truck business. So, therefore, I'm not wondering the automotive in industry goes down by 24%. Steel and coal goes down by 45% in Europe, 50% in, German, uh, in Europe. Uh, if I go to the chemical industry, we have a decrease of 16%. So, this has an impact. There's no, no, no possibility uh, to have no impacts, and, but that's our challenge as a manager uh, to improve business. But I'm a total believer, like Ms. Atali, the crisis will not be over in 12 months. By the end of 2010, this will be a longer period, and we have to take care and we have to accept this. So, Minister Tiefensee, it looks like Germany could be the owner of a national railway for some time to come. <laughs> the, uh Deutsche Bahn AG ist ein ausgesprochen starkes Unternehmen, international aufgestellt und wir diskutieren natürlich immer wieder darüber, ob wir mit einer Teilprivatisierung mehr Geld erwirtschaften, um uns international besser aufzustellen und auch in Deutschland eine bessere Qualität zu realisieren. Ich bin mit Rüdiger Grube einer Meinung, dass wir in der nächsten Zeit uns konzentrieren müssen auf einen Weg, ohne die Teilprivatisierung voranzutreiben, aber dass die Teilprivatisierung nicht in der Zukunft ausgeschlossen ist. Wenn sich die Situation verbessert, dann kann es durchaus sein, dass wir diese Frage uns in vier oder fünf Jahren wieder vorlegen. Bis dahin muss die Bahn auf anderem Wege stark bleiben. You say partial privatization, if we're looking about turning challenges into opportunities, mightn't it be conceivable even perhaps then to go the full route and look at a full privatization? Nein.
Is that no, that is not the case for Germany. In Article 87 of our Basic Law, our Constitution, a very important place in the Constitution, it is enshrined that the sector that deals with infrastructure and the organization of infrastructure, that must uh, remain within the purview of the federal government at least up to a percentage of 51 percent. And this will not change in future. But that's not at issue here. The Deutsche Bahn is is strong also because of the income that it generates, that with the financial strength that it has, it will be able to meet the challenges. What's more important is that we change the modal split, that more goods are taken off the roads and put onto rail and also onto the inland waterways. And that is why Germany is investing in the combined terminals where you have a hub and where you can have that modal split from the road to rail. 150 million are spent every year. Uh, we are bringing rails straight back into factories and companies. And uh, also, we are making that link with the inland waterways. That is the solution and philosophy for the future in order to integrate the different modes of transport in a much more efficient manner. And then it will be possible to be economic, uh, efficient, and also environmentally Friendly. I'd like to ask John Rice how the crisis has been changing the way that GE does business. We're hearing a lot about the reconfiguration of supply chains, for example. Your company extends its supply chain around the globe. What are you doing to make, uh, to lower costs and make that process more efficient? Well, <clears throat> supply chains have been reconfiguring for a while because I think a lot of manufacturers uh, stop chasing low labor costs um, in the last decade because they, they realize that, that labor costs change over time. So you have to have different reasons for being in place as manufacturing. So we're in China or Southeast Asia or, or the United States, wherever we manufacture, we're there for a purpose that typically transcends the cost of labor. So I would suggest our supply chains have been had been changing for a while now, uh, this, this economic climate certainly encourages more of that. Uh, every country that has a stimulus program basically has a jobs program, and they are stimulating the creation of employment in their, in their, in their countries. Uh, so I think that we obviously want to take advantage of that everywhere we can. Uh, the big danger is protectionism that there will be a recoil uh, because that these become more than jobs programs. They become pr protectionist. And I think that will take uh, uh, an economic situation that is likely to last longer than we would like and stretch it out even further. Some economists have suggested that perhaps there is less lobby for protectionism than there might have been in the past because so many firms do work internationally, have global supply chains, and would themselves feel the effects of tariff-related price increases boomeranging back? Do you think that's true? Well, I, look, I think it's a thread-the-needle play. I mean, on the one hand, you do, to stimulate your economy, you have to create jobs. But you have to find a way to do it which doesn't shut yourself off from exports uh, around the world. I mean, we're we're exporting from facilities in the United States. We have export operations here in Europe. We take advantage of global trade every day, so trade barriers and tariffs will hurt us and, 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 and limit our ability to create jobs. Ron Widows, certainly uh, few industries are as dependent on trade as yours, and supply chain reconfiguration and falling demand have meant a, an 84% drop in net profit for you last year in 2008. What's the longer term picture? Are you confident that demand will rebound to the vital levels that it had before the crisis began? Uh, <clears throat> no, I, uh, I, I think what we've seen is, uh, and, and to the comment that was made earlier, uh, we really began to see changes uh, in the world, and the shipping industry maybe has a little bit uh, of upstream visibility. We began to see changes in trade flows quite some time ago. Volumes began to change, some sourcing pattern changes uh, associated with that. 
the general deterioration in trade flows on a, on a global basis, some more in some areas than others, uh, over the last two years. Uh, so I, th I think there, there was a number of things that were already taking place that the financial crisis had nothing whatsoever to do with. Um, some maturing in the offshoring in certain uh, segments of, uh, uh, of the world, certainly the U.S. much further down the road of uh, offshoring manufacturing uh, than Europe or uh, uh, some other places. Um, some tapering off of uh, foreign direct investment associated with that manufacturing appetite uh, offshore. Uh, but a number of things were contributing to some changes. The financial crisis development exacerbated some of these things, uh, made some things a bit worse that would have transpired anyway. Uh, the narrow issues of downturn in the maritime sector of the shipping industry would have transpired anyway. We were headed towards a cyclical downturn anyway. Uh, that the, the demand dropped off so substantially made that situation significantly greater. You layer that together with uh, uh, what you could maybe term ir irresponsible investment uh, in assets and, and you have a situation like what has manifested itself now. The interesting aspect of what has taken place, which probably does affect uh, sourcing uh, supply chains uh, in an interesting way, is uh, you know, the, the, uh, the need to create jobs, the investment in infrastructure, which uh, for a variety of reasons will take place in a more robust way in China maybe than it does in other parts of the world. The result of that, maybe the unintended consequence, is they will open access through that infrastructure development to an even lower labor cost force, uh, which will continue to provide at least the cost uh, benefit or, or appetite that's driving globalization. Uh, and uh, as was mentioned, it's not just about cost, it's about infrastructure, it's about assets, it, it's access, it's about efficiency. That dynamic has some interesting implications for other countries in Asia who are anticipating getting some benefit from the rising labor costs in China well, that maybe doesn't look quite the same as you look at over the next decade as what it might have looked otherwise. Uh, that you would have manufacturing move around to other areas, maybe not quite the same. So you do begin to see some things that will affect how people think about how they invest, where they invest, uh, what trade patterns and growth rates are probably different going forward. I think the notion that two years from now or, or whatever you subscribe to in terms of economic health in the world, it'll be back the way it was. Well, the, way, the way it was, I think, is gone. So the world will look different, Very, you know, you, you, some care in being too predictive, but probably growth rates into the mature economies of the world a little bit less than what we've seen, and certainly a lot more growth, uh, particularly in the domestic market growth in India, China particularly, and the effect that that has on trade flows could be quite considerable. Kenton Kalitekin, you certainly have a business plan based very much on expansion. You're running an ad at the moment showing Kevin Costner saying everybody feels like a star on Turkish Airlines. But the fact is fewer and fewer first and business class passengers are willing to pay the kind of fares uh, to be treated like stars. How is the crisis affecting the aviation market and your product. Okay, uh, when I was studying economics, uh, there was uh, the, the subject of uh, market failure and one of the special cases was the public goods and the free rider problem. And I know that in, uh, in the immediate future and also in the, in the long run, uh, corporations and states will not be willing to pay free riders for higher uh, and better products. However, uh, there will always be a market for these, and actually, uh, what we are doing, we are uh, uh, we are uh, configuring our new generations of uh, of aircraft that we are about to buy, and instead of putting like 48 seats for the business class, now we reduce it to 28, and instead we put like 63. Uh, Pre economy premium seats in between those two. So what we are trying to do, we are uh, trying to, uh, you know, the uh, the bring the 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 price that customers are willing to pay for a product uh, to the configuration of the product instead of playing with the uh, revenue management systems where you charge a 
wide variety of prices to the same product, we, uh, we, we are trying to make these two things closer together so that uh, people will get, uh, uh, there will be less consumer surplus and people will get uh, a product uh, that they are willing to pay for. And uh, actually, uh, we are really concentrating on our business for the future of, of our sec uh, sector. And uh, we don't want to make money or earn money in other fields. Like uh, we stopped, for example, selling duty-free on board. And we are uh, simply an airline and uh, we don't... We, we leave this business to the shopping malls. And uh, so, again, selling food uh, for, for money online, uh, we don't do it. And like we, we feel the cabin attendants have uh, safe, uh, safety issues to take care of. And uh, we really don't want to make uh, cross-sectoral cross-subsidies and personal cross-subsidies. And uh, actually, uh, we... We are a part of a value chain. It's a fancy word, but uh, we feel that we are the only uh, the uh, the actor which is under pressure, and we are really trying hard. And we cannot uh, really uh, go beyond certain limits. We cannot fly an aircraft 25 hours a day because there are only 24. So there are limits that we can do. But we also want other participants to our value chain to come into the picture. Because we see the transportation uh, as, as not as just simple source of income, especially the airports, not a source of revenue for governments or the states. Rather, the, these are the basic infrastructure uh, which generates the, uh, the income for the all. And also we want airline, uh, the aircraft manufacturers to come into picture uh, in order to, I mean, they are refusing to share the burden for the very uh, future where we have a lot of question marks and uncertainties. And uh, rather than uh, like uh, having, uh, revising their commercial policies and charging uh, reasonable prices for the aircraft, they keep uh, playing with the, with the rate of productions just to keep the prices. So we are uh, really working under uh, hi high pressure. Actually, uh, we, are, uh, we are always restructuring. We are at the front end. We are restructuring our companies. We are trying to uh, revise our business models, try to uh, really uh, come to the basics. However, there is a predatory uh, competition. And uh, other uh, colleagues also uh, said that you know, there is uh, excess capacity. In airline as well, there is an excess capacity. Why? Because there is an, uh, there's a global financial machine which created easy credits so that a lot of people can easily come into the picture. And uh, this type of globalization I call predatory globalization is leading to predatory co uh, competition. Let's go right to the competitor sitting next to you <laughs> and ask him. I'm sure you're not predatory, Mr. Hunod, but um, certainly Air Berlin has had a difficult time of it uh, recently. Uh, some people are predicting major consolidation in the aviation uh, industry. Do you agree with that? Would you say we're going to see some airlines simply go under? Of course we see a uh, big consolidation if you see the major carriers in Europe. But I would like to point out some other points. Uh, we are talking about globalization and I think globalization is very important, especially in the transport industry. And the airline industry is an industry which in the past has managed their own crisis very well. Think of 11th of September, SARS and everything, the oil crisis. We were always able to manage our, our crisis by reducing capacity um, or uh, adapting the capacity to the market. What we see currently is much more important for our industry is that we get the conditions and the framework to do our job. And this has a lot of to do uh, with the governmental rules, especially if we look uh, into Europe. We are discussing about uh, emission trading. We say as an airline industry, of course, we do our part of the emission uh, reduction, but it has to be on a competitive way. That means emission trading can only come if it is worldwide and not uh, single emission trading in uh, some countries or in Europe. Another point, which is uh, a secondary point, which has to do with financing. What we see currently now is 
that we go to nationalism in banking. You see, uh, I give an example. The Royal Bank of Scotland was very uh, famous in the German market, spread credits all over Germany, and there was a nice competition between the banks. And now when the banks get the subsidies from their countries to stabilize their business, this market is gone. So what we need now is we come, must come back to initiate the economy that we get the money into the companies. And that has a lot to do with Basel II because a lot of the bankings they have to change their accounting system, they have to uh, account their risks to the equity, and that means currently there is no fresh money coming into the market to stabilize the economy for the future. Liquidity issues. Do you think that if we do see further competition in aviation, are we likely to wind up with a less competitive industry and a much higher priced industry? Okay, it says, has a lot to do, I saw Mr. Tajani this morning here, it has a lot to do with his decisions in the future market in Europe, because we see some big global player and the commission has to decide whether there will be competition in the future or not. You see a lot of, uh, I say national carriers being or became private over the years and for us as a privately owned airline or on the stock market who came later into the market, it's very difficult to compete with them because they have a lot of time ahead with slots they earned from the government, with aircraft they got from the government. So to get a real competition, we have not to look into global or in, into single markets uh, national-wise, but we have to look Europe-wise and worldwide to get a fair competition. But of course, it has to come to a consolidation. Lee Firstling, I'd like to talk a bit about the crisis and how it's affected competition between different modes. There are some people predicting that your segment could well wind up profiting from some of the trends we've been talking about, that there may be a shift from air freight onto roads. What do you think? Um, are you seeing some positive signs? Uh, I hope, I hope, I, I should do that for the industry. If you take uh, uh, equipment man manufacturers of uh, commercial vehicles, we see a uh, business that has gone down with about 90%. If we compare the first quarter of this year with the first quarter last year. And uh, that is a very heavy blow. So all what we can get into our uh, transporters, our customers of work is of course good for our industry. Uh, but I don't think there will be uh, major shifts and quick shifts in this industry. I haven't seen it before. Uh, the, shift, the only shift I've seen over the years is that the growth of the transport work has mainly gone to the roads from the 70s and onwards, uh, whereas then the railroad has not profited from the growth uh, of, of uh, transport of goods. Uh, the air freight and the, um, uh, let's say, the road transports have been throughout the years here very much in balance with each other and especially with the high value goods uh, that can take uh, a high transportation cost. Air freight is an excellent transport mean. I'd like to um, turn now to what governments can do. Our two ministers have been very, very patient here at the end. When we're talking about balance between different modes and sectors, we sometimes hear some criticism that the way that the fiscal stimulus packages are designed, Mr. Albanese, possibly favors some modes over others. We heard Mr. Atali, for instance, uh, mentioning that the fiscal stimulus, which is looking for projects that can go ahead immediately, tends to favor perhaps the old over the new, the innovative. Also, the priority on shovel-ready, perhaps, uh, tends to sometimes prejudice big, let's say, construction projects, road projects, uh, as opposed to smaller ones, maintenance, uh, perhaps even rail. How do you see it? Uh, do we have some built-in distortion in the way that fiscal stimulus is uh, carried out? Um, yes, I, I think we certainly do. There's no doubt that uh, the government uh, that, that I'm representing here has uh, embarked on a uh, $35 billion Australian dollar uh, stimulus, 
in terms of uh, road and, and rail infrastructure. Um, and there's no doubt that uh, part of that, the bring forward, it's far easier to bring forward a road project, uh, particularly when you have a country the size of Australia, uh, than it is in terms of getting a rail project up and running. What that points towards is that as policy makers, uh, we need to make sure that, uh, it, it seems to me, we, we shouldn't repeat the mistakes that have led to a failure to, or, or the, the real market distortion is uh, a failure to invest in the productive side of the economy and instead investing in, uh, in uh, perhaps governments being focused on, uh, on, on less productive side. As policy makers, uh, we need to break the nexus that is there between the political cycle and the investment cycle. The political cycle, whether it be three or four years, will inevitably put pressure upon decision makers to make populist decisions that provide immediate benefit. The fact is, if we're serious about developing long-term infrastructure, the time frame, by definition, uh, can be a decade or more. So we need to uh, have political structures that, uh, that address that distortion. Otherwise, inevitably, uh, it will occur both in the good times and the bad. So we need to make sure also that our investment decisions, uh, which are dealing with the immediate, uh, the needs of the immediate, um, in terms of dealing with the economic, uh, global economic recession, the immediate need to create jobs, uh, that we are at the same time looking for the longer term. So we need to factor in long-term decision-making, whether it be increasing the capacity of our economies, whether it be dealing with climate change and, uh, and uh, the need to uh, take into account the relative uh, impact of, uh, of emissions. Uh, hence, uh, at the same time as we're doing this, uh, Australia's emissions trading system uh, includes transport as a mode. Uh, we need to acknowledge that th there is a distortion built in right now for the failure to, to price carbon. And uh, we're doing that on a national basis. We, at the same time, are very committed to, when it comes to international uh, dealing with aviation shipping, we believe the only way you can deal with that is through a sectoral approach, uh, through uh, the relative bodies, ICAO, IMO, etc. But I think, uh, I think we have a, a, a real challenge, and as, the, uh, as the, the title says, but also a real opportunity uh, at the moment to address these issues. If we just deal with the short term, inevitably there will be a distortion in where the investment goes. Camille Lerlings, let's pick right up on that word opportunity and ask where do you see the most important areas for focus in terms of government providing help for the transport sector to adapt, mitigate and modernise? Well, I think that we have to address two challenges. First of all, is a challenge to try to prevent a big wave of unemployment as much as we can, because unemployment will further hinder the economic recovery, will have a lot of social effects. There is the crisis stimulus package for the short term, but it has to be timely, temporary and targeted, really at reducing uh, 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 unemployment, but also at really making us structurally stronger. And in our country, we were quite even-handed, invest for the next two years, really the next two years, it has to be invested, in both rail and road. For instance, maintenance, you can do it without long procedures, you make the quality of your product higher and you keep people employed. I agree with Mr. Atali, we have to be careful that we do not make our deficit even much bigger. And that is why it has to be timely and targeted, not go a lot into the future. But what can we do more? And that's a structural challenge. Often, politics is not a solution, but the problem. The bureaucracy is often the problem and the hindrance, and we have to be honest in that. We are changing our laws to make our procedures twice as fast, from 11 years to create an infrastructure project to five years. And it's not easy, creates a lot of discussion, but we are going to do it, and this is good both for the roads and for the railroads. We will have 30 crisis projects to enlarge existing roads, existing ones, not new ones to landscapes, not to discuss anymore, created within two years. 
Um, I think that is very important if we really want to become stronger. We have to break down bureaucracy. Then talking about railroads. Um, it's very good that we talk about model shift, but let's do it in the right way. Let's not favor railroads by making the roads much more unattractive, but let's favor railroads by making railroads even more competitive. For instance, by introducing a fair internalization of external costs for all the modalities that will show certain uh, advantages of railroads, but by also truly creating highways on the rail. Let's see how much hindrance there still is if a train wants to go from Rotterdam to Genoa. Hindrance, hindrance. The German presidency, dear Wolfgang, did a lot in this respect, but we have to push on. Monday we were in Genoa with Vice uh, uh, President Tajani of the Commission. We agreed on this first corridor from Rotterdam to Italy, one safety system. We agreed to keep on investing in reducing bottlenecks. That's important. But may I ask one more self-critical question? Do we as politicians really do enough to make the real world competitive? Are we really uh, investing in a truly independent, truly completely independent allocation of capacity? Or is there still connection with certain companies? Are we really rationalizing the railroad operation, like Deutsche Bahn, that is really a front runner in this term? Or are we still seeing the rail sector in some countries as a kind of social employment project? And we have to be very self-critical. If we want railroads to grow, we really have to modernize this business itself. And then the last one, I think uh, Monsieur Atali was right again when he said, or we are going to work better together on a global level, or there will be the tendency to have uh, protectionism again. I agree, but let's do everything we can to prevent this protectionism. And so let's work together, especially on innovation. Electronic cars do have a big chance. Let's combine our efforts. Let's try to find in Copenhagen with the new American administration that there's a chance. Let's find a road together into a CO2 emission trade scheme. And let's do that together our best to also invite our friends from India, from China, from Brazil, the new factories of the world, to also in a certain way join in. Then we have a global chance. And let's then truly fight the tendency for protectionism. And let's be self-critical. We can say it to each other here, and it's very important, this venue. But let's be open to the companies. If these globalized companies are truly convinced that we don't fall into protectionism. I sometimes wonder whether we're strong enough, and I hope that we will continue to be strong, even when the crisis takes much longer than certain people hope. Thank you very much. I want to come back shortly to protectionism, and our next panel is very much devoted to issues around Copenhagen, but perhaps uh, staying with the idea of roads and rails, and uh, going back to Mr. Tiefensee, um, certainly the German government at the moment is quite focused on the auto. We've got the scrapping scheme, and we've got the Avrak Premier, we've got uh, the big, big sweeteners being op offered to the various Opel bidders. Is there a risk here in trying to manage the crisis that we sacrifice long-term sustainability aims to short-term crisis management? Thank you very much for this question, but I, I want to come back to the, uh, uh, the talk with uh, um, Mr. Hunhold and uh, with Kamil Erlings. I want to underline that I think uh, I I'm totally agree with uh, Mr. Hunhold. The government has to create the, the right frames uh, for, the, for the companies, especially in aviation. And we create in the last months a so-called um, airport concept, and we discussed it last Wednesday in the cabinet, and we underline the, the very great uh, um, opportunities in, in developing aviation. In, uh, uh, in developing the, the airports. It's very, very important um, for an export nation like Germany uh, to have uh, good airports, seaports, and the, the lines behind them in the, uh, into Europe. Firstly, the second, we spoke about single European sky to organize the, the lines between the cities better, to, uh, to uh, decrease uh, CO2 with emission uh, on this way. And I totally agree with him. Uh, what we need is in, uh, in, uh, in emission trade, we need an international solution. Not only a European, not only a national, we need an international solution. And that's why I discussed with my new colleague uh, Lahoud uh, last uh, night 
uh, we spoke we spoke about uh, the the opportunity to come together and and what i've heard last night it was wonderful barack obama barack obama and my colleague lahoud sitting in the first row here uh, he said there are open windows open windows in the united states to change the uh, um, the opportunity the way to to bring uh, the 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 battle against climate change forward. And that's why I'm very hopeful and I'm sure uh, that we will have good solutions on the international level and the ICAO and the IMO, uh, uh, the side of, of, the, of the sea uh, transport. Your question was, what, what can the uh, government do? Yes, this Abwrack Premier is one of our, uh, uh, of our um, projects to solve the crisis. And I think it's one example, one ex important example, that one nation look for solutions without protectionism. We want to open our uh, country. We want to give uh, support not only for the uh, German companies, the German automotive companies. No. Um, we want to... Uh, support the French, the Japanese uh, companies uh, with the money by the federal government of Germany. And I think that's not only an example, that's uh, what you have to do. Open the windows, open the frontiers. We need, we need to work together and then we can solve the crisis and, uh, and we'll be stronger uh, bef uh, after the crisis uh, than before. Mr. Gruber, the uh, Abwrack Prämie has been tremendously popular here in Germany and certainly it uh, is not protectionistic. It does uh, allow purchases of foreign autos as well. But are you worried when you look at that scheme and others that perhaps we're not really um, creating additionality in the long term but simply moving investment forward and possibly even looking at a kind of a boom-bust fiscal cycle here, that we've got all this money being poured into fiscal stimulus packages now, and then tremendously indebted governments that will cut back later. What does that mean for the transport sector? Aren't there big ri risks there? I see the biggest concern which I have is that now with many measurements which are now initiated, we are creating already the next crisis. This is my biggest concern which I have, first one. Second one is, I think insofar as the cooperation between government and industry is concerned, I would like to really ask the government, the politician, to set up really favorable business conditions insofar as free trade and fair competition is concerned. For example, less administration, as you mentioned, is so important. If you would like to transport one container from Leipzig to Shanghai, we need 85 stamps. What we need is one commonly uh, transport letter. It's easy to do, but frankly speaking, I do not know why this is not possible. Second one is reduction of market and entry barriers. For example, take France. We are sitting together in the European Commission. France is not willing to open the passenger, the real, the rail passenger traffic markets only the rail freight market. Germany, for example, has opened already in 1995 for passenger and for rail freight traffic. So, this is the next one. Then I would like to fight really for reduction of unequal market conditions. For example, why uh, the railways have to pay uh, fuel taxes yeah, uh, to compared to other industry or VAT, they have to pay VAT. This is, frankly speaking, not fair. And last but not least, insofar as emission uh, trading schemes are concerned, as of 2013, take the example Deutsche Bahn. Deutsche Bahn, as of 2013, we have to pay only for uh, uh, environmental uh, penalties, we have to pay 130 million each year. This is not fair. Camille Ellings wanted to add something there, I think. Uh, perhaps to, to just shortly also answer your question about this, this tax scheme to replace your old car for a new one. We have it in the Netherlands as well, and there is something good to it, because the, you don't only stimulate the industry, uh, but you also stimulate a greener 
uh, 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 car park in your country, which is good for the environment. But it has to be very temporary but it, because it costs a lot of money. If you talk about a structural thing, this cannot be structural. But we have structural challenges. We could cooperate much more in using our tax schemes to stimulate the right innovations. If you see what's happening, for instance, in this electrical car business, and if you then see how completely diverse certain countries are in stimulating something, then for a car manufacturer, he doesn't get the optimum stimulus to really push on with innovation. So let's try to align also our uh, taxation schemes. Let's try to align the things that we want to stimulate, the development and also the market introduction. I think that that's uh, a very uh, important uh, thing to do. Then talking about the rail sector, let's also use these kind of venues to be very open to each other. I was amazed. I was amazed by a statistic that showed how many employees the rail business has per kilometer of track. I know that's not something that's always 100% comparable because situations uh, differ a lot, but still figures say a lot. If I tell you that this, uh, this graph shows that there is a wide range from 16 employees per kilometer in the Ukraine to one employee per kilometer in the USA, uh, then, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have a world to win and we can truly stimulate each other in making the real business a much more competitive one. Mr. Gruber mentioned, uh, as Mr. Erlings did as well, um, a push to reduce rules and regulations um, to try to make bureaucratic processes more efficient. I'd like to ask our two aviation uh, spokesmen, are you um, optimistic that the open skies effort will proceed, or are you worried that possibly the crisis could actually put a damper on liberalization? Perhaps you first, Sister Hulmelt. I think the single European sky is a must. If you look, uh, and this is an infrastructure thing, in Europe we have 47 air control units. In US we have one. So we are flying not on a direct pattern, we are flying zigzag, and uh, this is a point where we can save money, where we can reduce emission trading, and this is a governmental thing which we have to implement. Luckily, uh, we have to do, or luckily we are now in a process in Germany to change our basic law to get this run, but I think the main work has to be done in the European, uh, in, in the EU. Mr. Kali Taken, uh, are you optimistic that the skies are going to keep getting brighter? Well, uh, well, uh, we have no problem with open skies, and uh, we can we can deal with bureaucracy, no problem, because it, it's a theoretical problem. But when you go into the field, we we know how to deal with the bureaucracy. Uh, but uh, coming back to this uh, one issue, now we are discussing about the, the role of transportation for economic recovery in general here. And uh, yeah, uh, but we, we are not referring back to fundamentals. Now we are, uh, we are being asked to swim in a pool where uh, there is a big hole in, in the bottom and the, the, the water is leaking. And that I mean there is a, there is a the sickness in the global financial system. Unless, unless we fix this problem, unless we make a new architecture of global uh, finance, and unless we design it and implement it and uh, put it in force, we won't be uh, really uh, you know, getting these strings together for, for the whole world. Otherwise, I know, uh, next day I have uh, in my office, again, I'll be fighting. Uh, I mean, there, there's no problem of competition, actually. There's a problem coming from the financial sector, and we know that this system is not trustworthy, and we are still uh, being pushed and forced to work with, within that system. And uh, this, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are competing. Like, we are in the same alliance with Lufthansa. We fight like cats and dogs for just one single passenger, even though we are in the same alliance. But what we achieve together, combined, is that we give more opportunities, more options uh, collectively to our, to our passengers. Uh, and the, we are being uh, squeezed by low-cost, low-fare airlines, the charter airlines, charter airlines with some seat-only business, and you name it, and non-aligned uh, colleagues who, who are really doing a great job. So uh, what, what I mean, that uh, really uh, we, can, we can talk hours and hours unless we don't correct the, the foundation of the system. We can uh, deal with the, the details in the several uh, stories of the, of the building. Thank you. Um, 
at the at the risk of being the non-European representative, um, uh, to take up the comment of uh, of uh, my colleague from Air Berlin, we need to not move towards European open skies. We need to move towards global open skies. Unless we do that, we have a potential real problem of adding to distortions in the market by changes in regulation. An example is an emissions trading scheme that that charges for the first point of arrival after Europe means through an accident of geography, uh, it further advantages the mid-hemisphere hubs against uh, Australian carriers and carriers in, in Asia. And we need to make sure that when we're looking about uh, at, and I agree with the comments about open markets, we need to avoid protectionism, we need to make sure in the design of schemes and in policy solutions, we actually look at global solutions in the longer term. And I think in some of the measures that are being undertaken in aviation, they will lead to a further distortion of the market. Uh, I flew here via Dubai. It's not a, a non-Annex 1 country, therefore no penalties whatsoever, a complete market distortion, which is why we need global solutions when it comes to global industries such as aviation and shipping. Uh, with rail and road, Australia doesn't have quite the same border issues for <laughs> obvious reasons. Uh, we get wet. Um, but it is particularly important for us, but it's also important in terms of a global solution and where we're heading that, w that we actually have that international perspective all the time, not just some of the time. We're going to be talking in our second panel more about uh, global aviation, but I would like to pick up uh, on something else that you said, Mr. Carly Taken, and that we heard from another panelist as well, namely the concern about the continuing lack of liquidity and what that means for your businesses. Lee Erstling, I know that a lot of your clients are holding off purchases of new vehicles. There's underinvestment. You said that means that fleets are going to be older. What kind of safety and environmental implications does that have? And should governments be concerned? Yeah, I think, the uh, yes, the governments should be concerned, or let's say the people being out on the roads. What's happening now is with the credit crunch that small and medium-sized companies and most of the transportation companies are small and medium-sized. They find no financing of their working capital. And uh, we simply have to fix the financial system to, to get it working again. It's so important for the whole business we are in and also for the whole value chain from uh, the mining over the steel it's a huge uh, two uh, half fabricates to uh, commercial vehicles or uh, autom automobiles. There is a huge underutilization today of capacity, and it means also that a lot of investment produ products are, are aging today. And I would say that before we are over, uh, 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 through this crisis, probably the average age of uh, fleets will go up with uh, probably two, two and a half, three years. And it means uh, not the latest uh, environmental standards when it comes to the engines and the emissions. Uh, you have the braking system, you have a lot of other safety issues on the vehicles that definitely will be aging. And I think that US decision makers here in various governments uh, you have to take this also in consideration when you look upon this industry and especially the safety matters. What could be done here could be discussed, but uh, in some way or the other to incentivize the industry or incentivize the transportation industry to make renewals. On the other hand, it doesn't matter so much in the very short term because uh, 25 to 30 percent of all vehicles today are off the road, are not in operation at all. And that means less emissions totally from the 75 being in operation. So it will help us a little bit, <laughs> but it's just for, it give, gives us some relief for uh, a year, one and a half year. But we have another problem here, and that is with a very low demand, the vehicle manufacturers have to continue, are forced to continue to develop 
environmental friendly technologies with a sales volume that is 50% or even lower of what we had two years ago. And it means that our R&D spendings will double in percent of the sales. And that's a key concern for uh, the industry today. How to sustain the future demands of development of new engines, new safety matters, issues on the, on the vehicles. Looking at um, liquidity, Mr. Rice, certainly governments have been doing what they can to get it back into the system. There has been concern that some of those policies themselves, as well as industrial bailouts, fiscal stimuluses, and so on, may have hidden protectionist aspects. We know that the U.S. took out its most overt Buy American clause, for instance, but there's been worry that, for instance, TARP funds perhaps may be allocated to banks that only lend to domestic U.S. borrowers. Uh, where do you see protectionist risks, whether hidden or, or overt? Well, I see them in the language that governments use to describe how they're going to allocate stimulus funds. Um, so we, and we talked a little bit about that before. Um, I do think, and to the point that was mentioned er earlier by several of my colleagues, the importance of getting the financial markets restarted can't be understated in terms of the global economy. And one of the things that governments can do is to expand their export credit facilities. Um, now, some would argue that that's, that could be biased lending too, but in the absence of global financial institutions stepping up and doing their job, there may be no better way to create domestic jobs in lots of different countries than to have expanded export credit facilities, um, create more capacity for Exim in the United States, for the export credit facilities here in Europe and in other countries, because that will fill the void until the global uh, financial institutions can step up and, and do what they're going to need to do to bring this economy back. Ron Widows, what about you? Uh, we've heard from the World Bank that of the G20 countries which so bravely said uh, that they were against protectionism, 17 have adopted some form of protectionist measure. Where are you most worried about protectionism? Well, you're, <clears throat> you're right. We've seen, uh, I mean, there's, there's a very long list uh, and, uh, and many governments have engaged uh, and, and hopefully it is uh, short-term targeted uh, and uh, uh, intended uh, not to last. Um, but a little bit related to your, your question about liquidity. Um, in, in the maritime sector, the lack of that liquidity uh, is ironically a good thing. <laughs> um, it's going to take many years to chew through the assets that are coming over the next number of years. And that's one area where we're beginning to see some some activities by government to artificially infuse investment to prop up shipbuilding in particular, uh, particularly in China and Korea, which, uh, if not done, uh, may well uh, go the way of assisting an industry to get back on its feet sooner. Uh, so in a, in a way that's maybe a little more subtle than some of the other things that have been done on direct uh, tariff uh, uh, increasing of duties, Governments that move to put money into certain sectors, which in, in the case of the maritime sector tends to be a very emotional thing, uh, close to the heart of, of governments, some more than, uh, certainly some more than others, there's a propensity to make investments uh, that will have an effect to uneven the playing field. So if you talk to uh, the f folks from Japan today, they'd probably have a little bit of angst with what's going on in Japan and Korea. Uh, because it does uneven the playing field as well as have a spin-off effect uh, on an industry in general. I'd like to go to a colleague of yours who is in the second row. Uh, there I see him, Spiros Polemas, who is the international chamber, the, the chairman of the International Chamber of Shipping, and ask you, if you would please, for a last word in regard to protectionism. Um, your industry, the industry that you uh, share with Mr. Widows, is of course one of the most affected by drops in international 
trade. Shipping is also one of the industries not covered by any international trade agreement. Who is there out there who can act as a powerful advocate for your industry in terms of arguing for liberalization in transport? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I have been very um, heartened today by what I have heard because all ministers, I think without exception, um, Minister Tiffany and also the other ministers, as well as the um, industry representatives, uh, have talked about, have talked against protectionism, which is, uh, I think, extremely important. And, and also, uh, they have talked about the, um, the provision of uh, credit. To answer your question first, uh, directly as to the last uh, uh, question that you posed, the um, uh, people that uh, have been uh, tasked and should be tasked to, to deal with it are governments. Um, I would remind everybody that in the G20 meeting, uh, they had pledged uh, that they are against protectionism, but I can tell you that as far as my association is concerned, we have um, found that 17 out of the 20 uh, G G20 nations are engaged in uh, some form of uh, protectionism. So therefore, uh, it is down to governments, the heads of state and the trade ministers and transport ministers uh, to do something about it and to uh, stay away from engaging in that sort of protectionism. It isn't immediately apparent. Uh, it is, as some of uh, the panelists have uh, discussed, uh, hidden uh, in various uh, ways. Uh, I also think that as far as um, trying to get uh, back to where we were in a sense, uh, one has to think about the fact that without credit, trade cannot function, and we're talking about international trade. And that is what the government should concentrate on, uh, rather than protectionism or other measures. And I would suggest that if credit was to return to normality, and I'm not talking about providing liquidity for ordering ships, for example, because I would agree with uh, uh, the gentleman from Neptune Orient that um, there has been uh, overbuilding of uh, ships and creates overcapacity. But the provision of credit for, uh, for, for trade, for international trade, is extremely important. And that is the way that we should go uh, back, not necessarily to where, where we were, but to some normal uh, um, economic uh, upturn in the immediate future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our panelists for being with us today, for your very, very interesting inputs and um, for your patience. For some of you had to wait a long time <laughs> to get your turn. Now, um, I'd like to express my gratitude to the audience as well for your attention and for the fact that you will punctually return in, let's say, 25 minutes. So shortly after 11.30, please, back in this room for the second installment. And thanks so much to all of you and to our translators also.